Hello and welcome to today's lesson on Half-Life, which is part of the Atomic Structure topic in GCSE Separate Science Physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at understanding what the half-life of a radioactive substance is. So if we're successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to understand and define what half-life is. Look at the factors which affect half-life and work out the half-life of a radioactive substance, which falls into the following part of the GCSE separate science physics topic of atomic structure, which is half-lives and the random nature of radioactive decay. So when an unstable nucleus decays and becomes a stable nucleus, the unstable nucleus can release radioactive emissions of either alpha, beta or gamma. But how can you measure this effect of radioactive decay? Well, you do this by considering the two steps to a nuclear decay. Step one, the nucleus decaying and becoming stable. And then step two, the nucleus releasing radioactive emissions as it does this. Now we can use either of these steps to measure nuclear decay. So when measuring the amount of radioactivity, there are two key measures that we use. Number one, activity, which is how many radioactive nuclei decay and become stable every second. Now one Becquerel is one radioactive nucleus decaying every second. Now this was named after Henri Becquerel who discovered the concept of radioactivity. Now the second key measure that we use is count rate, the number of radioactive particles of either alpha, beta or gamma detected per second by a detector. Now count rate is measured in per second. Now the detector needs to be the same distance away from a radioactive source to gain accurate results for a count rate. Now it's important to note that physicists use, use either measure depending on the ease of measurement and it's actually not uncommon to see physicists change how they measure radiation in an investigation. But the activity and the count rate are, no, are not going to always be the same value because each decay might produce more than one emission or the detector might not pick up all of the radioactive emissions given out or the radioactive emission could pass through the detector without being registered which is why the activity and the count rate can differ in values. So let's just summarize what we've learned. Activity is the number of radioactive nuclei decaying and becoming stable every second and is measured in Becquerel's. Count rate is the number of radioactive det emissions detected every second measured in per second. Now each quantity can be used to measure the radioactivity of a source. Half-life can be measured in either the change in activity or the change in count rate of a source. Now, either unit can be used in physics. Now, it's important to know we measure radioactive decay by measuring either the activity or the count rate of a radioactive sample. And we do this to measure something called the half-life of a substance. So the half-life of a radioactive isotope is the average time it takes for the number of radioactive nuclei in the isotope in the sample to half or for the count rate or activity of the isotope in a sample to fall to half its initial level. Now, an example of this is if the count was 600 counts per minute and it takes 30 minutes to go to 300 counts per minute, well, the half-life is, is, is 30 minutes, so therefore it would take a further 30 minutes to go from 300 to 150. Now, it's important to note that all radioactive substances have a measured half-life. Now, half-life is similar to rolling a dice. Now, an unrolled dice could be considered to be like an unstable nucleus, and a rolled dice for one particular side, such as six, could be considered a stable nucleus. Now, it's important to note that you can't say whether an individual dice would roll a six. And in much the same way, you can't say whether an individual nucleus will decay. So, as a result, we know that radioactive decay is random. You can't influence whether an individual dice will roll a six and you also can't influence whether an individual nucleus will decay. So radioactive decay as well as being a random process is also a spontaneous process. But what you can do is you can predict how many dice roll a six on average. So by that logic you could predict how long it would take for half of the unstable nuclei in a sample to become stable. Now this idea is called the half-life. 
So it's important to note that the half-life for a particular radioactive isotope is constant. So that means it always takes the same amount of time for a radioactive sample to fall to half of the value of its count rate or activity. Now we always state the half-life is the average time as the radioactive decay, like mentioned before, is a random event. So radioactive decay is constant as each radioactive nucleus has the same chance of decaying as each other. So the random nature of radioactive decay requires repeated readings to be made over a long period of time. So, over time, a radioactive nuclei will become non-radioactive. So, for example, in one half-life, 100% of a radioactive sample will drop to 50% of a radioactive sample. Then in another half-life, 50% will fall to 25%. So, the value of half-life is constant for a sample. So, the half-life is the time it takes for the radioactive count rate or the number of radioactive nuclei in the sample to half. So, for example, it's important important to note that the radioactive nuclei will become non-radioactive. So what this means is if you start off with 600 radioactive nuclei in one half-life, 300 will, will still be radioactive, but the other 300 will become non-radioactive. So they don't disappear out the universe, they just become non-radioactive or stable. So over time, more non-radioactive or stable nuclei are produced. However, more are produced at the start and fewer are produced over time time. So this is called an exponential decay. Now like we said before, radioactive decay is a random and spontaneous event. This means that individual behaviour cannot be predicted, random, and individual behaviour cannot be influenced, spontaneous. So therefore, the chance of a decay happening is the same each time. So the chance of decay remains constant. The only reason why radioactive decay slows down over time is because there are less radioactive nuclear to in fact become stable. So, therefore, the chance of decay happening is the same each time, which leads to the concept of half-life. So say, for example, the half-life is three years to go from 600 to 300, it will also be three years to go from 300 to 150. So you can work out how many half-lives have taken place by taking the original value, half in it until you've reached your wanted value, then working out how many times you have half this particular value. You can then find the time taken for this by multiplying the number of half-lives by the time taken for one half-life. So that's an important idea. Now, as we know, when calculate the mass after a certain time, we can use a long methodology to do this, because you can fully work out the change in mass or number of nuclei after every half-life, and then determine values. But this is a long and time-consuming method. There's actually a mathematical shortcut we can use instead, because we can use a more mathematical approach to determine the mass produced after a certain number of half-lives. So say, for example, let's consider a sample of radioactive isotope R which contains 100 grams. After one half-life the mass remaining is going to be a half of 100 50. After two half-lives, it's going to be half of that 50, so 25, but it's actually a half to the power of the number of half-lives, so because there's two half-lives, it's 0.5 to the power of 2 times by the initial value 100. And then after three half-lives, it's a half to the power of the number of half-lives, 3, times by the initial value 100, which gives us 12.5 grams. Now, this doesn't just have to be mass, by the way, it could also be count rate or activity. So we can actually use a way to work out a formula for this. So this is the formula which you've got to be aware of. We can determine the mass of a radioactive isotope left after radioactive decay from a half-life by the following formula. The mass of radioactive nuclei remaining is 0.5 to the power of n, where n is the number of half-lives passed multiplied by the initial mass. Or we could also write this as the initial mass over 2 to the power of the number of half-lives. This is actually the same equation written in different forms because a half, uh, so multiplying by a half, is the same as dividing by 2.
Now, this formula allows you to work out the number of mass, activity or count rate due to nuclear decay easily. So this can be used in any of those situations. Now, this is a formula you must remember for your examination, but like we said before, it could be count rate. So it could be the count rate remaining is going to be the initial count rate uh, times by 0.5 times by the number so to the power of the number of half lives passed or it could be the activity as well any of those could be fine so let's have a look at an example question a particular radioactive isotope has a half life of six hours a sample of this isotope contains six, 60,000 radioactive nuclei calculate the number of radioactive nuclei of this isotope remaining after 24 hours well, the first thing that you would do is you'd work out the number of half-lives. What's the value of n? Well, we know that there are 24 hours and each half-life is 6 hours. So how many half-lives fit into 24? It will be 4 because we know 6 times by 4 equals 24. So we know n is equal to 4. So we then do the number of radioactive nuclei is the initial value at the start, 60,000, divided by 2 to the power of 4. Now, 2 to the power of 4 is 6. 16, so it's 60,000 over 16, so after four half-lives you are left with 3,750 radioactive nuclei. Now as well as doing it mathematically, the activity or the count rate or the number of radioactive nuclei can be plotted against time and you can find the following graph. Now this graph occurs as the nuclei are radioactively decaying over time and becoming stable. Now this graph is an example of an exponential relationship. Now an exponential exponential relationship is a relationship where the rate of change is constant as a percentage of a value. Now in this case, in a radioactive decay, the time taken to fall by 50% is constant each time. So this relationship is an exponential decay because this rate of change is a decrease. It's fallen by 50% each time. Now to work out the half-life from a graph, what you would do is you've got to draw on the graph two lines where one activity is half of the other. So for example, when one line is where the activity is 200, the other line is where the activity is 100. You then extrapolate the lines downwards and find the corresponding time and the difference between the two times is the half-lives. So this could be used if we're doing activity or massive radioisotope or count rate. So you find the time for one activity and you choose this value. You then find the time for the activity which has half the value of that first activity and then the half-life is the time taken between the time for the first activity and the time for the second activity. So that's an important idea that we can work out a half-life via graphical methods. So in this example we found the time when the activity is 8,000 and then we found the time when the activity is 4,000 and the difference between the two is the half-life. Now always try to use rounded numbers such as 8,000 and 4,000, 6,000 6,000 and 3,000, 10,000 and 5,000, as then it's easy to take those measurements on your graph. Now, let's have a look at an example here. So at 8,000, the half-life is 2.5 seconds. So the time, sorry, is 2.5 seconds. At 4,000, the time is 9.5 seconds. So the half-life is the difference between the times. So it's 9.5 minus 2.5, which is seven seconds. So a half-life in this example for this radioisotope is seven seconds. Now, really to get the best values in your experimental work this should be taken over a number of values and then a mean should be calculated now calculating an average will minimize not completely get rid of but reduce or minimize the random nature of the radioactive decay so like we mentioned before as the mass of the radioisotope decreases with time this graph is referred to as a decay curve the measurements show that the mass decreases exponentially it drops by a constant factor 50% in equal intervals of time and that's the same for the count rate or the activity. Now in theory a radioactive decay curve never falls to zero but in practice the level of radiation falls to a level indistinguishable to that of the background. Now again in theory the half-life remains fixed so the value calculated for half-life should be the same no matter what two values are used in this method. So you could do 1 in 0.5 
you could do 0.6 and 0.3, you could do 0.5 and 0.25. When you work out the half-life via graphical methods, you should get the same value each time in theory. However, in reality, the half-life will vary slightly as radioactive decay is a random event. So getting variations are not unexpected, getting variations are not due to an error you've carried out in your experiment, rather they are there because of the random variations of the nature of the event. Now it's best practice therefore to when minimizing this to take multiple half-lives from your graph and find an average. So just to clarify again, the half-life of a radioactive isotope can be worked out from a graph from an experiment. So you can plot the activity or mass of radioactive nuclei or count rate on the y-axis against time on the x-axis. You then must draw on the graph two lines where the activity is half of each other. You then plot the lines downwards, find the correspondent times for each of the lines, and then the difference in the times is the half-life. So let's summarize what we've learned in today's lesson. Radioactive decay is random, and the half-life of a radioactive isotope is the time it takes for the number of nuclei of the isotope in a sample to half, or the time it takes for the count rate or activity from a sample containing the isotope to fall to half its initial level. Now you should be able to explain the concept of half-life and how it relates to the random nature of radioactive decay. And you should be able to determine the half-life of a radioactive isotope from given information. And you should also, for higher tier students, be able to calculate the net decline expressed as a ratio in radioactive emission after a given number of half-lives. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to understand and define what half-life is. Look at the factors which affect half-life and finally work out the half-life of a radioactive substance, which is part of the half-life topic in GCSE separate science science physics in the atomic structure topic. Thank you very much for listening to today's lesson and I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on half-life. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.